our second Sciences and the Sacred Seminar. I want to start off with a welcome. Um, to Welcome to our campus. Um, this is based at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Mahalo, 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 veli na mai me ke aloha, mai ka o ili mua ano kalai ku kahia kalai hua ku ka mole olu ole hua. Aloha ko Hawaii pai aina. Hello to everybody who has joined us tonight. Um, I know that it is dinner time and so I know that many of our friends who have signed up who are going to be listening to this recording later on. But we're so excited um, to have the second of our seminar series on Mauli Ola, which is um, just the essence of life. And so um, we want to thank you for joining us. Um, we want to start off by uh, mahaloing our funders and our supporters for helping this seminar series uh, to be able to take place. Um, so we have to thank our support from the University of Hawaii at Manoa Seed Ideas, the Biocultural Initiative of the Pacific, and Hawaii Sea Grant Program, the Ulana Ike Center of Excellence. Um, and before we begin tonight, um, I want to offer up a land acknowledgement, but not in a traditional, well, maybe I won't say traditional, more English kind of Western land acknowledgement. I want to offer up an acknowledgement of this place um, in Hawaiian. So, um, Oh, I can open my heart no more I know I know I'm a wee him more to Oh, yeah, I can know ya Oh, who can I know I'm a look at him more to I know all the night I can let him more to Really, oh, boo, boo, no, oh, papa, ya, oh, who can I Mahalo. And with that, we chant into being from our ancestors, Papa and Wakea, and birth these islands. And so you know that we are really centering um, today, tonight's seminar in who we are as a Hawaii people. So um, we're so, so lucky to have with us such wonderful, wonderful speakers and experts, practitioners um, to talk about Maoli Ola. And Maoli Ola really is health, the essence of our health, and of course, the way that we get health is not only in addition to you know how we behave in life but it really truly is the legacy that our ancestors have left us and what we want to talk about tonight is how do we ensure that that corporal legacy of our ancestors continues to thrive for our love we are people and so tonight we have um three really just really wonderful um speakers and i'd like to introduce them to you and then I have one more chant that I want to share because in Hawaii, if we were doing this live, I would give you guys lay, um, but because I cannot, I will give you a chant instead, just one more. So um, our first panelist tonight is Dr. Noah Emmett Aluli. Uh, Dr. Aluli lives on Moloka'i and he is the executive director of the Moloka'i General Hospital. Dr. Aluli is one of the four Native Hawaiians who graduated in the first class of the University of Hawaii at Manoa John A. Burns School of Medicine and has had a family medical practice at the Moloka'i Family Health Care Center since 1976. Um, Dr. Aluli Koka founded the Napu'uvai Inc., a nonprofit dedicated to the betterment of health conditions of Native Hawaiians, and he's a founding board member and current kupuna president of Ahahui o Nakanaka, the Native Hawaiian Physicians Association. In addition, he's an assistant medical professor at the Johnny Burns School of Medicine, and as a founding member of Protect Koho'olawe Ohana and one of the Koho'olawe Nine, Koka stood up against the federal government to stop the military bombing of Kanaloa Koho'olawe 
and later became the chair of the Ko'olawe Island Reserve Commission. Kauka is a co-founder of the Pele Defense Fund, which is dedicated to defending traditional Hawaiian rights and customs of Akua Pele and protecting the Waukele Opuna rainforest from geothermal development. Hawaiian t tradition teaches that Native Hawaiians are descended from Akua, our deities, and Kauka's motto is that the health of the land is the health of the people and the health of the Lahui. So we are so grateful to welcome Kauka. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Desi Small Rodriguez. And Dr. Desi Small is a, uh, Rodriguez is a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation and a Chicana. She's an assistant professor of sociology and American Indian studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. And as a social demographer, her research explores the intersection of race, indigeneity, data, and inequality. Her teaching and advocacy center on disrupting settler colonial systems and rebuilding data for strong indigenous futures. She has partnered with indigenous communities in the US and internationally as a researcher and data advocate for more than 10 years. She directs the Data Warriors Lab. Don't you just love that name? It's awesome. An indigenous social science laboratory. And she is a co-founder of the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network and a founding member of the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. So we welcome you, Dr. Desi, and we really wanted her in this conversation so that we can not only kind of center Hawaii health issues, but find solidarity and find models of what is going on in other places and with other indigenous people. And our last um, but not least panelist is going to be Dr. Kilda Fox. Dr. Fox is the first Kanaka Mali to receive a doctorate in genome sciences, and he is a co-founder of the Native Biodata Consortium and an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego, where he is a co-founder and co-director of the UCSD Indigenous Futures Institute. Kiolu is also affiliated with, I forgot how to pronounce this, so I apologize, Data Science Institute, the Department of Anthropology, the Global Health Program, the Climate Action Lab, and the Design Lab. And Kilu's focus, work focuses on the connection between raw data as a resource and the emerging value of genomic health data from indigenous communities. He has experience designing and engineering genome sequencing and editing technologies, and a decade of grassroots experience working with indigenous partners to advance precision medicine. And if you have visited the Bishop Museum lately, probably in the last year or so, you might have noticed this really amazing exhibit on science and race and the intersection of how that, how that worked out in Hawaii. And it was co-curated um, by Dr. Fox. And so if, I, I really hope that many of you had the chance and opportunity um, to see that exhibit because it was truly wonderful and it was a way to really bring home um, critical race and racism and genomics and genetics um, really to the fore of Hawaii. Okay, so as I said, if we were in Hawaii right now, I would be giving all of them lay, but because I am not, I'm going to offer one more oli or mele or chant um, to just welcome you um, to this virtual space. So mahalo. Um, so we're going to start off with a talk story. Um, and you know, oftentimes when we talk about Native Hawaiian health, it is often within a framework of disparity. Um, but one thing that really, really um, has always uh, impressed me about Kauka Alui's leadership um, is how he turns what might often seem as adversity and problems to empowerment and agency. So I want to start off by asking Kauka to, um, to talk about and I don't know if Coca is, is Coca spotlighted now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen actually, um, so that we can see Coca. Aloha, Coca. Um, and I was wondering, can you tell us and start us off with telling us some stories about 
what, how you have seen the landscape of health research and funding, how that has changed over time. Well, thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying um, aloha Molokai Ahina, aloha um, Pu'u Kapele, aloha um, Awinala, and aloha Kaua, which is greetings to Molokai and the land and the ancestors who kind of lived and still wander here. Uh, greetings from Pu'u Kapele, uh, where I live in homestead land. Um, greetings to the evening, the setting sun, the time, and greetings to all of you. Um, I Kamaoli Ola, um, bringing life to Kamaoli Ola, um, who is on another sense, one of our health deities. And it would be nice to get to know him through this process. And thank you for the opportunity to, to join this seminar. Um, well, Indigenous data sovereignty and is really important and we can talk about it later. So <clears throat> I got um, involved um, after graduating uh, from Johnny Burns and then um, doing a, a one year um, surgical residency, um, part of a kind of like rotation, interdisciplinary rotation. And then I told my professors after the first year that I wanted to learn from the community. I wanted to learn health from the community and not from the hospitals in Honolulu. So I chose Molokai, which was be between Ko'olawe and also Honolulu. And, and Molokai had, uh, and still has about 60% Native Hawaiians. And um, it, was, it was here that I just uh, did everything as a, you know, general practitioner, um, did the ER, did all the deliveries, did the home visits, drove the ambulance, changed diapers, emptied commodes, did everything in a rural hospital possible. It was a um, community owned hospital in Kanakakai. Um, <clears throat> I got really excited about um, heart disease because that's what we were seeing more as, as uh, the, the only clinic, um, clinical practice and family medicine in Kanakakai on Molokai. And so in, um, and can we just put the slides up, my time frame, Rosie? Yes, you want me to, I'll, I'll share your slide right now. Um, let's see, I share screen. Okay, this is something that was put together by Joanne Sark, and, and I'm sure um, most of us know her. <laughs> it's our 34 years of uh, cardiovascular um, disease research and policy making. Um, in 1985, um, we got involved in a, um, a study um, <clears throat> with the University of Hawaii um, School of Public Health and also the, um, um, what do you call that, uh, Intersalt uh, <clears throat> research that was been doing um, nationally and internationally. And um, what it was, was looking at um, cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, and we published uh, in 1993, the first and now still the only Native Hawaiian um, heart health risk factors um, and it became a real kind of launching point to really documenting um, our problems, our risk factors um, in the native Hawaiian community. Um, it was kind of like something that we went door to door to get the um, Hawaiians, um, half Hawaiians and few Hawaiians uh, on homestead land and elsewhere to participate in the study. Um, which included kind of having to carry on for 48 hours a, a bag of urine so they can measure, you know, how much salt you took and how much came out in the urine and what your blood pressure was. Um, then also doing all these um, lab studies and, and analyzing it, you know, and blood pressures and, and lifestyles and 
a whole history taking and we had about 124 people signed up because they they wanted to help improve upon their own health and their family's health and the native hawaiian and their community's health also yeah was not just about themselves and and so we had at the same time established a, a group um advising them uh, a group of about four or five of us who called ourselves Napuvai, which is the hearts in Hawaiian. And um, it was kind of like establishing also Native Hawaiian heart health kind of team. And that was in 1991. At the same time, um, we kind of like, as a follow-up to that, um, did a Ho'oka'ai, a Molokai diet study. It was a study that was organized by Oregon Health Sciences. They had done a study in the Pima Indians to look at their diet, traditional diet, and their, their diet presently at that time. They did it in the um, some of the, um, <clears throat> the tribes or the, the settlements of, in Alaska. They looked at their diet ongoing and all their risk factors. And of course, they, they ate a lot of blubber, yeah? So they were interested in A1C. Well, for us, we had to devise a diet. They wanted us to do something different. Um, and the difference is that we wanted to look at the traditional Hawaiian diet. What was it, what we call it, the pre-Captain Cook diet, the pre-Cook diet, where you had the things from the ocean. Um, and also occasionally you had um, pig, but it was mostly fish and limu and taro and sweet potato. So what we did is after the regular diet and measuring the important, you know, cholesterol values, triglycerides, uh, diabetes and its control, blood pressures, and then we moved down to a traditional diet for about two weeks. And then we had to go and analyze each food stuff that people were eating because that's never been done before. And then from there, we went back to the McDonald diet, the 40% diet to see what the change was. Remarkable changes physically. Um, we couldn't have them lose weight, but just physically and psychologically they felt. And, and of course, marked improvement in, in all those risk factors that we were measuring. Um, <clears throat> that diet was, was, was something that the participants did not want to see commercialized, but then it was taken by Wainai and uh, made into a weight loss diet. And then later on, it was um, put into um, menus and, and sold at uh, Zippies. And so, you know, but anyway, just having that diet study was something that really kind of brought us into focus as to kind of like how to not only do the study, but how to promote it. And so we were kind of like instrumental in having uh, federal government, especially Danny Noyd, look at our heart health. And for the first time we had some data, some hard data. And so we um, ended up at the uh, um, Senate at that time, Select Committee of Indian Affairs, and uh, were able to establish a Native Hawaiian Healthcare Act, which set up the um, communities to be able to kind of establish their own health programs and centers on each island. And then we had the young doctors uh, graduate to kind of set them up also. So we started working with Hawaiian physicians at that time communally. Uh, we started Napu'uvai and from Napu'uvai, we continued cardiovascular risk factor clinics in 1992 um, all the way through to 2003. Um, and then in 1992, um, the uh, Reauthorization Act was continued and it's be still being continued for the funding of five Native Hawaiian healthcare systems on each island. Um, <clears throat> we got this uh, rural grant, outreach grant, uh, 1998. And then we kind of gathered um, at Kalukoi, 
uh, with funds from Native um, Health, Native NIH's um, Heart and Lung Blood Institute. So we're able to gather a whole bunch of physicians um, and we're able to establish the Ahahui Onakauka in 1998, which is a um, Native Hawaiian Physicians Association. Um, I was a member of the Native Hawaiian, I mean, the Heart Health Institute's uh, minority group. And, and that's where I really got to know what was up nationally. And I can talk about it um, later on, having made uh, contacts with all those who are looking at minority health, heart health, and those programs um, and the research that leads up to better care. Um, we got more monies from um, uh, to continue these activities, and we kind of extended meeting to all the islands involving a significant amount of, of doctors and having them begin to kind of like set up different programs, knowing that every island is different. Um, so just moving on, we went on to kind of like continue our research in a program in a called Hua Carnival Calico. And this is where we really excelled upon establishing a precedent for um, community-based participatory research and going to the community as a group, asking their permission and explaining what the outcomes would do, not just for paper, but they will be involved in writing the paper in, in presenting the results and looking at programs that would improve upon their own health as being parts of that. And this is, we took like about, oh, 900 people who were screened at, at Napu'uvai and then looked at those who were still living and those who had died and try to connect the risk factors to the causes of death. And so that's the last paper and there's hopes to kind of finish this off within the time that uh, we're still around. Okay, so that's just, being on top of this has really given us um, the trust needed by our communities to be involved in ongoing projects like genomics and, and the trust that they have for us because they know it's just not for their pockets um, but other pockets, but for the community to kind of like be able to improve upon their health and, you know, um, how to prevent this in the future generations. So, and that's a long story, but just this whole research had really led to the most important thing is the trust of the community and to be able to kind of like um, be there and continue the work such as we're talking about um, establishing indigenous genomics uh, center or, or so. You can learn from the others who are doing that already. Mahalo, okay. Um Is it okay if I stop share right now with the... Yeah. With, okay, I want have a couple questions to ask you. So much, you know, what I'm picking up and hearing is first, you know, the Molokai diet was really this first study in Hawaii done that using Western methods, but showed that our heritage foods were really the healthiest. I mean, that that's just so amazing. And, you know, when your work on cardiovascular risk factors began to get recognition, I heard that you were appointed by the director of the NIH to the Minority Advisory Committee. Can you talk a little bit about the converging similarities that you saw and the relationships that you were able to build while you were on that minority committee? So, so what, we, what we learned for sure is that Take care of the land, and the land is going to take care of you. That's just just the thing that Molokai has always said, and the Kapunas have always said. And and you know, that means you grow the foods, and you take care of the resources and the water that feeds the loi, or the or the so-called patches, the uh, taro patches, and then how that all interrelates to the shoreline protection and the protection of the reefs. So, so that was something that really kind of like 
That was the most important thing that was established by the whole KI diet study that we take care of the land because the land will take care of us in the health food systems. But, you know, being, being appointed, um, I was kind of really amazed that there was the, um, the um, National Medical Association and the breakout group of the all the ABCs at that time, the all black cardiologists. I mean, they kind of like really hanaid me and the work that we're doing within the Native Hawaiian community on heart health. And they've been kind of like my mentors, our mentors in the researches that followed. And anytime we kind of like uh, show up uh, to help them when they have their conferences here, and, you know, some of the feeling they have is, you know, us people of color got to stick together. <laughs> no, no, really, really. Oh, yeah. And you know, we still appreciate going to their conferences because they have a rhythm when they talk. They're musical. They, they're, they're like us. They kind of use their hands and their emotions. So that sinks in rather than just kind of sitting in a hotel and, and, and getting, trying to pick up. Uh, different kind of ways of, you know, doing scientific reports. They're kind of like in their in their sense, in their humor, you know, make more. It's, it's better giving, so we appreciate that yeah. a lot. Um, but then I I got to started looking at, at the funding in Indian country. Visited, a, you know, um, more of the Arizona um, as a group. Uh, the Arizona um, patients and saw what they were doing and how diabetes especially was hitting them and then how kidney disease I mean it wasn't the casinos was gathering things it was the dialysis centers who were the centers and that was really hard for, for me especially to kind of come back and that's a whole nother problem you know, diabetes and, and the kidney disease. And here we're just looking at heart health. So that is extended and, and broadened my own kind of like me to kind of learn about what else we're doing at this point in time and how to also prevent dialysis as long as you can, yeah? Right. And how diabetes and heart and especially hypertension interact. Yeah. And, and really kind of like, kill the kidneys and to be able to kind of do that research that would say, oh yeah, oh yeah. But in my clinical practice, in our practice, we're always talking about that. Yeah. Um, and then seeing what the Hispanics were doing, you know, in their communities, and we were kind of like trying to keep up with them as, as they kind of like um, continue to kind of need that help as they kind of are going to be the next most populous um, racial group in Hawaii and just kind of learn how together they are. Um, but anyway, um, and being able to do like how the um, uh, National Medical Association and at that time the um, inspiration for me was the Native American uh, Physicians Association and how they started organized, especially uh, so we got involved in organizing the uh, Kaukahui, the establishment of the Native Hawaiian Physicians Association. And now it's just beginning to kind of like really peak out again as we did when we first started. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, you had brought up a little bit, you know, how much I heard a lot too about how much trust it took to do these studies to, to bring people in. and. I was wondering with regard to trust and accountability, what safeguards have Native Hawaiian health organizations implemented to protect community well-being? I, I heard that you know you were really instrumental in the Native Hawaiian Health Care Act, and from that we were able to establish independent Native Hawaiian health care system. But what did what were you guys able to do because you had this independent system that wasn't tied to the university, it wasn't tied to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs? Well, the closest thing that came after that, and that's not on my um, time list, that was in 1993, I think, was the Pao Kalani Declaration. 
that was a group of, of elders, yeah. elders, Kumuhula, um, different Hawaiian organizations um, got together and started looking about all these issues, all these issues of commercialization, intellectual properties, you know, and, and, and how we had to make sure that, that we had something together so that we wouldn't be, well, having to settle for other kind of like a hospital or so-called research kind of like uh, without having the consents and the expected outcomes. And it wasn't just going to be for um, further research funds, but it was going to go out to the community to benefit those who actually participated in it. So it was in like, a, for me, it was kind of setting something up so that we would have the opportunity to make sure uh, that there would be um, community-based participatory research actually as part of any kind of research that was going to be done by Native Hawaiians. The only other safeguard that is working somewhat is that IRB, uh, the Ola Hawaii, you know, but, but it doesn't go as far as saying you got to do it this way. That's the community IRB. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm part of that member just learning on, on how to extend what we needed to do to make sure that there was community involvement because there's so much money going out for if you do Native Hawaiian research, but then there's Native Hawaiians and, and, um, uh, the Filipinos are recognized as, you know, that group, the Pacific Islanders are recognized as like that group, but they're just maybe one or two, but everybody's after that pot of money. And it's kind of like, come on, show us, but you know, how many you do have in road or how you're going to get in them in road in that research. Yeah. But those are the only other two, but I don't know. I haven't had the time to really sit down and hopefully you know, what would come out of some of this discussion was a pathway on how to, how to get, you know, something formal and accepted by all the hospitals and, and you know, all those uh, universities, all those coming from elsewhere and doing research, mm. you know, how wow. that's going to kind of like really help us improve our own health and not just tell us what's wrong. But the other thing I've learned is, you know, we don't look at it as a disease, but we look at our heart health. We don't look at it as a disparity, but we look at it differently. Rather than heart disease, we call it heart health. You know, so we try to change the negative to positive in all the kind of like follow-up kind of discussions. And, and when we're writing any other grants, it's health rather than disease. So we're kind of like putting that forward that way. So that's the only other thing that in my own kind of like small kind of like um, participation and attention, this is kind of as far as I can explain. But that's wonderful. I mean, that's so what I'm, I'm we're going to come back and talk to you more. I, we, we, uh, we really, really want to hear more about kind of the areas that you're, are most concerned to you, but I think what you have laid down as a landscape of, of your almost 50 years practicing medicine um, has really provided us with a pathway to start those discussions. And um, what I kind of wanted to do now is, you know, you you said that you learned so much from 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 your time on the on the minority um, advisory committee and learning from others. That that's one reason why we brought um, Dr. Um, Desi Small Rodriguez. And you know, I, I'm thinking maybe we can transition now um, to, to hearing from her. And you know, we were so interested. Coco, Coco talked a lot about how he learned so much from others, and and that was one reason that really inspired us and motivated us to, to to invite you to come and share with us. And and you know, in the work that you do, you do you do so much to that kind of reveals how data can help us tell our stories, but also how sometimes our data about us gets used by others to tell our stories and. Kind of the racialization and the intersection with indigenous health and i was wondering if you could share some of your some of your work and some of your examples with us sure yeah um 
Well, pivot dive, good evening uh, in my language. Um, I'm really honored and thankful to be here. Um, and uh, I want to just introduce myself. Now, Mokshihat Nahashive. Um, I'm Desi Small Rodriguez. Uh, my Shia name is Mokshihat. It translates to Bear Mint Woman. And um, I, uh, so I'm a, I'm a demographer, I'm a social demographer. So it's funny because I, um, I do a lot of health research and I often get asked, you know, what is my background? Uh, am I, do I consider myself a health researcher? And no, um, I'm a relative first and foremost. And everything that I do is to try to uh, strengthen our relationships, right? And our and to be in good relation with um, not only my people, but all of our indigenous people and health is such a core part of that. So I, uh, I, I, my work is all around data, rebuilding data systems for Native communities in partnership with, with our people um, and data by us and for us. And it can be data on our economies, it can be data on our environments, it can be data on everything from you know, uh, our demographics to our waterways to our, our food systems, all of it is health. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting kind of way of thinking about health and, and health equity um, and health data. Um, I really firmly believe that when it comes to indigenous health, everything is health. Um, and so when I was asked to talk about this, I, I was kind of thinking, well, I don't really do health, but um, but at the same time, everything is health. So, um, so I just want to share um, kind of my perspectives on this um, and really thankful um, to, to, to be able to do that. So um, uh, first I have to acknowledge where I'm at. I am here um, at UCLA, um, which is a land grant institution. We are on, on the homelands of the Tongva people. This is now known as Los Angeles and, uh, and UCLA just, we just passed, uh, well, the UC system just passed a, a fantastic policy granting free tuition to all um, California residents who are citizens of tribes, not just California tribes, but any tribe in the nation. Um, and so it's one step forward in uh, trying to um, really um, get at indigenous reparations for all of the land theft and all the, the, the genocide and the ongoing um, colonial uh, machine that continues to uh, to, to enact harm. Um, so I, I do want to acknowledge that this week was a big week for the UC system and um, for our Indigenous students. And, and I really urge other systems like the UH system um, to consider doing the same and, and how taking really concrete efforts um, and, and concrete steps, right, to, to, um, to really putting your money where your mouth is to, to support Native students. Um, I come from the Tisistats and the Sutta people. We are now known as the Northern Cheyenne Nation, um, but we come from two different peoples um, and uh, our homelands, the, the lands and the waters that raised me are in southeastern Montana. So um, I need to acknowledge my ancestors and who I come from. Um, I believe very firmly that I cannot be a good researcher without being a good relative. And so being a good relative means honoring my family, my people, right, uh, my tribe, my, my, my son, and all of the people that keep me accountable in, in the work that I do and in my life. So I just want to say Mia Esh and thank you to, to all of them. Um, so the work that I do is grounded in sovereignty. And I know there are different words for sovereignty depending on our different communities, right? The different indigenous backgrounds from which we come. Um, we have different words for this in our different languages. I spent a lot of time in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and I'm gonna share a little bit about that. Um, I spent a good part of, of a decade there. Um, and, you know, the, their, term, their term for the Maori term, you know, it's tiro ranga, tira tanga. Um, we have our own terms and our own words um, for this. This. Um, but um, I often tease folks that as an Indigenous person, as an Indigenous baby, kind of the first words that come out of our mouths is, is something related to sovereignty because we are born sovereign. Um, and, and so I, uh, I do a lot of work in partnership with tribes and uh, with tribal leaders. And so tribal leaders, I come from a, a, a family of tribal leaders. My, my mother was on tribal council. All of my aunties were on tribal council. My, one of my aunties was our first uh, woman tribal president. Um, and so I, I do a lot of work in partnership with tribal leaders. And I, want, I ask them to try to get their opinions on, 
on where we're at in, 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 Indian, in Indian country um, and where we're going. Um, and so this was part of an a interview project that I did quite a while back now, but I asked tribal leaders to tell me about sovereignty and what it means to them. And this is a quote from a, a tribal leader who asked to remain nameless, but he said, you can use it in all your work. And, and um, But it really carries with me in all of the work that I do and all of my research. And he said that sovereignty Oh, excuse me. He said, sovereignty as tribal nations was given to us by the creator. It is sacred. And so this concept of the sacred, right? How are we, um, how are we working in ways that honor the sacred, right? How are we relating in ways that honor the sacred? How are we researching in ways that honor the sacred? How are we doing data in ways that honor the sacred? Um, that's uh, what I try to do in all of my work. And it's, it's hard. It's very, very hard. Um, because the sacred, it's such a, it's, it's such a lofty and important um, um, aim to try to keep at the center. Um, but when I was thinking about this talk and thinking about health and health data and the state of, of health, you know, for Indigenous peoples, I had to think about, I have a lot of friends who are medical doctors. So I have um, I think half my friends are lawyers and half the rest of the other half are, are medical doctors. And here I am with two PhDs um, and I've probably been in school the longest. And now that I'm a professor, I'll be in school forever. Um, and I make the least money. So that's kind of our running joke there. But um, and thinking about health, you know, I'm I'm always thinking about the the foundations of, of, of health care and health systems. Uh, and really, as a sociologist, I'm always thinking about systems, systems and infrastructure and institutions and how all of these, um, how they all interact, right? And so, of course, we have, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, first, do no harm, right? That's a, a core part of this oath that all medical doctors, um, medical doctors take. So I was thinking about this notion of harm, right? And this concept of harm and how as a, as a researcher, I too think a lot about harm. Um, and regardless, you know, even though I am not a medical practitioner, right, all of us who are engaging in research in partnership with Indigenous communities, we have to think about harm. And so um, my research is really focused on sociopolitical processes and ideologies and institutions and how they construct, control, and erase populations and peoples and knowledges. And so I'm very interested in the harms that are done, uh, that are enacted um, through these systems. And so I look at erasure and resistance, and I look at uh, indigenous data sovereignty and governance. Um, and a, a big part of my work now is really focused on data for health and economic justice on Indian reservations. And that's what I'm gonna really focus on and um, what I'm most excited about. So when I, when I ask you know, people, what is health, right? We, there's all sorts of different definitions in, in terms of what health is, depending on your discipline, right? Depending on, on your country of origin, depending on where you're living now, depending on, um, on the government, right? There's all sorts of different conceptions and definitions of health. For indigenous peoples, right? We cannot think about health without thinking about the 500 plus years of ongoing colonization and how this is a cause of health disparities in indigenous communities and what that looks like today, right? It's not, it's not so much historical as it is literally our daily lives today. And so I often, you know, I teach students, I teach sociology classes, I teach public health classes, I teach indigenous studies classes. And often when I'm talking about colonization and settler colonialism, I often get, you know, asked, well, this is told or, you know, asked that these are, this is describing processes from so long ago, these historic processes, right? So how is it that these historic processes have actually any sort of impact on today? Um, and these are what students ask me, right? And it's like, because it's literally our daily lives today. You cannot remove our lived experiences, right, from the historical um, trauma and systems and structures that continue to enact harm. Um, it's not as though, right, colonization happened and then everything was great. Um, we know that's an ongoing system, right? So it's, it is a structure, not an event, which is what um, um, colleagues have, have said. Um, uh, Eve Tuck and, and her and her crew in Canada. Um, but if we think about right how health, um, the kind of ongoing colonial efforts, this ongoing colonial machine, how it's impacted health, we see it in lots of different ways, right? So from a, from a social demographer perspective, we see, uh, I, this is kind of just 
a snapshot of kind of the work um, that I've been able to be involved in, but it's it looks like this, right? This is a poster of one of my nieces, K. Sarah Stops Pretty Places. Um, she was murdered three years ago. She has still, there's still been no justice um, for her. Um, she is just, you know, one in thousands of Native women throughout um, the U.S. and Canada, right, who have gone missing, who have been murdered, uh, who are part of this missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls epidemic. Um, and so colonization looks like looks like that, right? Colonization also looks like our, you know, entrenched, right, inequality when it comes to housing, when it comes to our lived realities of daily life. Um, and on reservations particularly, I often tell people that the most successful example of, uh, of segregation in the United States uh, is our Indian reservations, right? Um, they continue today, right? They are uh, de jure, they are by law, um, uh, legal, you know, this legal segregation uh, forcing Native peoples onto these lands, um, lands where we were, you know, the intention was that we would die, where, you know, these places where we would die. We are, we are dying, right? Um, but we are also surviving and, uh, and we are also thriving. Um, and so we are pushing back very much so against that intention of, of uh, um, that was established uh, when, when those when reservations were uh, established. We also see, right, the, the tremendous impacts of COVID in our communities. Um, so many of our, of our people, you know, we've lost, in my own community at one point we lost, we were burying one person a day, you know, um, at the peak of COVID in our community. Um, we lost about 80% of our, of our language speakers um, on my reservation, in my tribe, right? We haven't even grappled with what that loss actually means for the future of my nation, but we know that it, it hurts, right? Um, and we cry. Um, we also know that our health is directly tied to our lands and our waters and our more than human relatives, right? Here's a photo of um, uh, the Colorado River and, and, and the poisoning of this river that runs right through Navajo Nation and also impacts the Hopi people. Um, and so uh, this is what we're dealing with, right? We're talking about how colonization causes health disparities. It manifests not just in our bodies, right, but in our communities, in our families, right? Um, uh, and and um, and so I want to remind people, right, that there is more money spent per capita for the health care of federal prisoners than Indigenous peoples in the United States. Um, so literally, from the very beginning, the inception of, uh, of this country, right, this country was founded on dispossession and genocide of Native peoples um, as part of the massive dispossession of lands. Um, there were treaties that were signed, so hundreds of treaties, um, 400 approximately between tribes and the U.S., every single one was broken, okay, but one of the provisions of treaties was health care. So health care is a treaty, right? It's not a gift to Native people, right? It is a treaty, right? It's an obligation, um, and we can see how time and time again, year after year, the federal government fails to meet that treaty obligation. Um, and so this is kind of the state of where we're at in terms of healthcare in the US for, for Native peoples on the continent. And, um, and I want to bring that back to data because data is a powerful tool in pushing back against the vast health disparities that we see. Um, and so I often think about, you know, this Hippocratic Oath, right? First, do no harm. Well, when we think about data, we can also think about that. You know, how are data being used for harm or how are they being used for sovereignty? Um, and by sovereignty, right, I, I'm, I'm referring specifically to indigenous sovereignty. So I know that folks have, you've already had some of my fabulous colleagues, Stephanie Carroll and Molly Hudson, talking about Indigenous data, Indigenous data sovereignty. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But of course, I want, I have to um, acknowledge uh, Linda Tuhiwai Smith, one of my PhD advisors and a, and a mentor of mine and just a phenomenal researcher um, and, and, and just Mana Wahine from, from Aotearoa, who reminds us, right, of just the harms that have been caused by research and data in our communities. Um, and how this is an ongoing process. Um, and so then what are data? So, you know, and when we think about what data are, there's so many concepts and, def and definitions similar to, uh, you know, what health is. But I don't actually care about 
anybody else's definition except what indigenous data are. What are what does data mean to Native peoples, to our peoples, to our communities? And so we have this definition of data that's been developed with lots of different scholars and communities all across the world about what Indigenous data are. And you'll see that data are literally everything to Indigenous peoples. It's data about our resources and our environments. It's about us as individuals. And it's about us as nations. All of this is, is Indigenous data, from our songs and our stories, right, to demographic data, to our health data, to information on our lands and our waters. Um, and so, but it, it is all Indigenous data. And this is important because we've always been data experts. So we have this knowledge within our communities and it's always been there. So how do we tap into it to solve some of the most pressing you know, issues in our communities, um, like all of the health disparities that we are facing? Um, so really, um, when I think about this work, I have to, again, I go back to, to Aotearoa and my time there, and I think about this whakatauki, this Maori proverb about, about people. So there's this um, whakatauki that says, he ahate mea nui o te ao, what is the most important thing in the world, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata, it is the people, it is the people, it is the people. And so when we think about health and health data and our populations and our peoples, in the indigenous world, we're not talking about a small number, right? We are vast, we are diverse. There's almost 400 million of us in 70 countries, right? We're spread everywhere. Um, we self-identify, you know, at the individual level, we are accepted uh, by communities as our members. This is all according to the UN. Um, there's historical continuity, right, with these pre-settler societies. We have strong links to our territories, to our natural resources. Um, we have distinct political systems, social systems. We have distinct languages and culture and beliefs. We're non-dominant groups with respect to our, our access to power, right? Um, and we resolve very strongly to maintain who we are and to reproduce our ancestral environments and our systems. So we know that we are vast and we are diverse and we're all across the indigenous, we're all across the world. Um, but the United States, right, like most settler states, most settler countries, takes a very narrow view um, of who we are. Um, and that uh, definition is what is used to collect all sorts of data, data on who we are, data on our on our health status, right? Data, uh, uh, everything that is collected about us through the federal government is funneled through a very, um, uh, uh, a very limited definition. And so the this is, you know, the Office of Management and Budget. Literally, there's this office called the Office of Management and Budget in the federal government that establishes all of these definitions um, of, of for race and, and ethnic categories. And it is those definitions that are used to collect data. Um, everything, everything that is collected in this country that is official data is funneled through this lens. So you'll see here, right, who is an American Indian or an Alaska Native? Um, it's a person having origins in any of the original peoples of North and South America and who maintains tribal affiliation or community attachment. So this is the, 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 the federal definition. Um, I just want to ask how many, much time do I have left? Do I have a couple more minutes? Yes. Okay, great. I'm, I'm just wrapping up. Um, so when we look at through that definition, right, um, there are lots of things that are collected using that definition, including the preeminent source of, of population data in this country, the census. So the 2020 census um, tells us a lot of things, right? Um, it's been uh, counting Native people since 1860, hasn't been accurate since 1860, but it's been counting people since 1860. Um, I served for many years on the Census Advisory Committee um, with um, some very fierce advocates trying to figure out how to get census data to be more accurate for Native peoples. Um, and it was a, a lesson in, um, it was a hard lesson in, in the fact that it's very difficult to change the machinery of government, um, particularly for populations who are considered a threat, right, to the U.S. Uh, to the U.S. government, to the U.S. settler state. Um, but what we do know is there is almost 10 million, right, Native people, American Indians and Alaska Natives. This population is growing. We're growing significantly. Um, 
and the majority of us are your neighbors, right? We're living all over um, in cities and rural areas and suburbia. We're not just living on our homelands and in on reservations, we're everywhere. But a piece of data that I wanted to share that has a lot of relevance to this work uh, and to all of you is that for the very first time, right, it wasn't until 2021 that we were able to, to first get the, the life expectancy calculation on a national level for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, and I think that, you know, that is absolutely unacceptable that it took until 2021 for us to even know what the life expectancy is of Native people, the first peoples of these lands, um, we didn't know. The data, the, the, it was never calculated. Um, and so you'll see here the life expectancy, which was finally calculated by um, uh, the CDC and, the, and um, the Center for Health Statistics, um, says, you know, their, their findings show that uh, our life expectancy is 71 years, um, which is the lowest of any racial or ethnic group in the U.S., um, you know, it's lo much lower than Hispanics, right? Lower than whites, lower than blacks. But if you ask any native, right, we're gonna tell you, of course, like, of course we're dying young. Um, of course, we, we've always known this, right? Um, I grew up, was born and raised on my reservation, right? I went to high school on my reservation. I graduated with about 22 students. Um, less than half of us are still alive today. Um, I'm, and I'm in my thirties, right? And, and I am not, this is not the exception. This is the rule in, in tribal communities, right? We are dying young. We are dying of preventable causes, right? Preventable disease. We're dying of accidents, right? We're dying, um, we're dying. And so what is, you know, when we're thinking about societies, right? What is the true measure of a society as a demographer, right? For me, I, it's death. How are, how are people dying in a society? How is the experience of death, how does it differentiate across age, across race, across region, across state, right? I want to know about, it's great that our people are, are being born, but how, what is your experience with death? Because the experience with death is very, very different, right? And it's patterned by structures of inequality. Um, so... There's lots of uh, more that I could go into, but there's a couple of big things that I think are on the horizon for Indigenous peoples in, in the U.S. that we're going to have to really start to think about. One is the fact that Indigenous peoples from Latin America, that are, those numbers are growing significantly, right? And according to the definition of who is an American Indian or an Alaska Native, these individuals are a part of that definition. And so um, there's some really important policy implications here because so many of the people who are seeking to come across the southern borders of the United States, right, they are indigenous peoples. They're coming from Guatemala, from Mexico, you know, from different parts of Central and South America, and they are indigenous. Um, similarly, you know, when it comes to um, these numbers, we have to really always be cognizant, right, that, that these numbers are embedded in power systems, right? Um, that they're telling us a narrative that wants to be told by who? By those who are in power. And so we have to always be critical. I always tell my students this, I tell my colleagues this, right? And I often use this, this, um, this, this cartoon, this, this graphic, because it, it illustrates it really, really well, right? So non-white babies outnumber white babies in America for the first time, right? There's this radio announcer. And the grandpa is sitting here, right, this old elder, right, is saying the second time. Because as Indigenous peoples, we remember a before time, right? We remember when we were the only ones. We remember when our babies were the only ones. Um, and maybe this collective memory, right, maybe it's something that we don't have individually, but it surely is something we can tap into as Indigenous peoples. We have a collective memory that remembers and we can tap into that. And this is actually real. So if you know anybody, if you have children or, or grandchildren or nieces or nephews who were born in 2012, they are the first uh, cohort since invasion um, uh, that is uh, majority non-white, right? So we know where the future of this country is going. Um, it is becoming increasingly more non-white. Um, and, um, and it's very messy, right? So there are so many different ways to identify who is an American Indian or an Alaska Native. 
all of the, the definitions, um, you know, they intersect, right? Um, this creates a real mess when it comes to trying to understand data, trying to disaggregate data, trying to use any sort of data, whether it be on um, population health, right? What is the population of interest that we're actually talking about? Um, and so the one of the main solutions to this is that we have to go to the communities themselves and how are communities seeking to be um, identified, right? What are the boundaries of the community and of the population that communities want defined? And how can we get those data on their terms so that it's actually useful? Um, and so, um, so we're doing that. So here's an example of a project. Um, this is in the before times, before COVID, um, as you can see with some beautiful, some of my beautiful research assistants, some of my brilliant and beautiful research assistants. But we did a survey of tribes um, to really try to understand how tribes are using data in the US, um, what their needs are. Um, we got 83% of, of tribes in, well, 83% of those who responded were telling us that it's really important to have data for governance purposes. So we need data for governance. And so we asked them, okay, how are you guys using data right now? Do you guys have a tribal data hub? Do you guys have IRBs or some sort of committee that is approving research um, with tribal members or on tribal lands? Are you engaging in data sharing? And so this is all important, right? Because this is about the health of our nations and our communities. Data is vital to the health of our nations and our, and our communities. It's, it's vital to the rebuilding of our nations in the aftermath, right, of, of all of the attempts to destroy. Um, and so we're seeing that how important data is to that rebuilding effort. Um, tribes are doing censuses and surveys. They are collecting data on their tribal citizens, right? They're collecting data on, on non-tribal citizens, right? So there's an active movement right now of doing data in tribal communities on tribal terms. And it's really exciting. Um, it's happening in the wake of COVID, of, of the pandemic, right? Um, uh, tribes are reclaiming um, and, and doing data on their terms, counting and, um, and really processing, right, how uh, the pandemic has impacted their communities. Um, it looks like this, right, the census, we're really continuing to push back against this extractive way of doing research in our communities. Um, it looks like this, right? Are people coming together, talking story, figuring out what is data for them? Um, how, how, how is sovereignty in action? What does that look like with respect to data? Um, it looks like tribes coming together in partnership, right? To work together on stuff like climate change. Um, and it looks like this. this is a big project that I've just wrapped up with my tribe on, on partnering with, with our own nations. How are we being good relatives in our own communities and doing data that we are asked to do, right, um, from our own people in our own communities? And so this is a, um, a resolution by the Tribal Council authorizing um, some of the work that I've been doing for, for my own tribe. Um, but this is my lab. So I run the Data Warriors Lab. We are an indigenous social science laboratory. Um, we're doing all sorts of uh, awesome things. Um, thank you very much for the time. And I, I want to hear from um, my friend Peolu. So I better stop talking. But um, soon we're going to have a bus of some sort. And we're going to be taking this on the road, going into tribal communities where we are asked to come. So this is really important, right? We have to shift away, the, move away from this paradigm of bringing students onto college campuses and just extracting and then sending them home and hoping everything works out to actually going into tribal communities where we are invited to go, right? Building data capacity, working on data projects that the communities want done, um, coming in a good way, leaving in a good way, only doing what we are asked to do, um, but really building that data capacity um, in community on homelands. Um, and so that's uh, that's what the Data Warriors will be doing very soon. So um, uh, Nia Esh, thank you so much. I look forward to more discussion. Um, you can find me here. Um, and I often, you know, one of the things that I always tell people is, there's all this talk about equity and justice, right? Regardless of what field you're in, health equity, there's talk about housing equity, there's talk about economic equity, right? Everybody's trying to figure out how they can do better with respect to justice. But for indigenous peoples, it means nothing without sovereignty. So um, yeah, yeah, Ash, thank you. Mahalo, 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 Desi. That was so wonderful. Um, and thank you so much for bring, putting it in perspective and kind of showing us how we can learn from our indigenous brothers and sisters elsewhere in um, what is now known as America. 
I want to move on to Kyolu. You know, Uncle Emmett started us off giving the landscape of indigenous data. Desi took it away and like ramped it up. And you know, now I'm going to hand it to you, Kyolu, and tell us about indigenous data futures and what do you think Kanaka need to know and um, how has big data and access to archival collections shifted how Kanaka should be navigating these future times? Raja that. Aloha and pomalie, everybody. It's getting late over here on the West Coast, but it's always beautiful to join you. Such an honor to be here with Kauka, Emmett Aluli, and Desi, and obviously Rosie and Sarah, and, and, and everybody that put this together. Malo nui for this generous opportunity. So I'm going to share my slides, and I'll be brief too, you know? Um, all right, ready? Here we go. Okay, so currently, Hokulea, it's on its way to Tahiti right now for a number of reasons. And I remember uh, once I was in Hawaii for the SACNIS conference in Honolulu, and Nainoa Thompson, Master Navigator Nainoa Thompson, said that one thing that was special about the first Hokulea voyages was that they were remapping the Pacific Ocean. So they were creating this high resolution way of looking at the, at the Pacific Ocean. And it got me thinking about remapping the human genome in a major way, just because there's all of these different ways in which bias is created because the, the many of you may not know this, uh, that the reference that we use to map the human genome to, it's from, a person of Western European ancestry. So it, it doesn't really help us out in a lot of ways and it introduces a lot of different forms of bias. So much bias, in fact, that new human genes were discovered when a high resolution genome reference was made of an individual from Papua New Guinea. Now that's pretty special. If you think about it in terms of standardization, new human genes which with functions that we had never been seen before in history have been recently discovered. So it, it leads you to think about like what else is out there. And I was going to do a whole talk on this, but I decided not to. Instead, I want to talk to you about data as power and the next 100 generations of indigenous data sovereignty and really lean into and think about the future with everyone here. And it's so special because, um, you know, as, as far as the things that we're thinking about, we have to build these things. We talked about how the UC system is now allowing um, federally recognized individuals to have access to free education in the University of California. And uh, Uncle Emmett, uh, uh, Kalka Emmett Aluli said that, that basically, he learned a lot from working with African-American communities and they have their own university, Howard University and many other um, HBCUs. So I think part of our future is building our own institutions and structures and places where we get to hold our data and vertically integrating to that. So I'm gonna get into that. Um, first, I'm at UCSD and there are a lot of things that are good here. Uh, including the surfing, but it's also an awesome place for genomics. And so I get to learn a lot about the ecosystem that's going on here. A lot of the major companies that develop the technology, how do they share data? What types of things do, do, we, do we do with these new technologies? And it's really given me an insight into thinking about the future and how we can apply many of these tools in our communities. And we recently started this Indigenous Futures Institute. There are a lot of amazing people that are involved in this, including my co-director and one of my co-founders, Teresa Ambo. She's awesome. And um, Wayne Yang, who's the other half of Tuck and Yang. And uh, Sarah Arendt, who is a geophysicist at SIO and is in Yupiak. And so we're building the future we want to see locally at our, at our school and focusing on our number of things. And really it comes down to how do indigenous people envision the future? In which ways? And I wanna tell you a few things that we're building. Can, I, um, can you share your whole screen? Sorry. Well, I'm not sharing my whole screen? No. Oh, what am I sharing? 
I mean, I see your slides, but I don't see, you know, it's not, it's not on a slideshow view. What's that? Oh, weird. Okay, I apologize. How about now? Uh, no. No. Uh oh. How about this thing? No, that's not going to do it. Um, I don't know why that's happening. This should work because. How about that now? It's good? No, but if you click on the side, you know, the slide numbers, then we'll see the slides. Okay. On the slide number. Okay. We see the slide in the middle and then the thing on the side. Nothing on the side? No, we see this. You know how like it looks like the regular view before you press slideshow. Oh, for real? That's yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, now it's good? Yep, perfect. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, so I just wanted to like get back to our roots and many of the places where we're from. My Mo'oku Auhau or genealogy is from Pololu on the big island or Moku Okeave. It's a very special place. It's a really interesting place for so many different reasons, but this place is kind of like the little fingertip on the top north part of Kohala. That's where we're originally from, but now we live in Hilo, like many different Hawaiian families. Um, and like many of those Hawaiian families, we've always been indigenous futurists. We've always been focusing on these incredible things, including creating some of the first color newspapers in the world um, and having electricity in Iolani Palace well before the White House. And so thinking about this, we're as a community always going to use the best technologies available to empower our perspective and empower our people. Um, the Big Island is also really interesting because it's all at once this incredible place where it's an epicenter for biodiversity with 10 out of 14 biomes on planet Earth, some of the most biodiverse uh, soil profiles on planet Earth. Here you see um, one of only two green sand beaches in the world. It's also an extinction capital of the world. And it is simultaneously an invasive species capital of the world, which makes it a very unique place. However, it's not just the, the, the Aina and the Moana and our, our nature and the natural world that's diverse. It's our community itself. And kind of building on what Desi was saying about understanding our census data according to the new census data, four of Hawaii's counties rank among the top 15 most diverse counties in the nation in terms of our communities of people who have been sharing and mixing our genomes for hundreds of years. The top county is in fact Hawaii County, number one, followed by Maui County, number two, Kauai County, number four, and Honolulu County is number 11. And that in itself is futuristic for a number of reasons that we're going to get into. When we think about diversity, what do we mean? What types of communities are we thinking about? But as a Polynesian person, I've always wondered how we got there. And I've always saw these figures that are presented in different, you know, magazines and science books and all of these other things that represent our diaspora and our migratory history in terms of thick black lines going in one direction, which if you've ever spent time on, a, on, on the sea, you'll know that that's just not how we travel. That's not how our ancestors traveled on, on Va'a and it's not an accurate representation of our diaspora and neither are many of the time estimates. So that's why it's also really interesting to think about all of the different lines of evidence and the types of data we have because that informs our identity today and the way that we create connectivity with many other different communities in the Pacific. In the 1940s, 1947, this guy Thor Heyerdahl actually had this idea that we came from the wrong direction. And that's what the whole world thought because we weren't in control of our own data. We were, we were responding to this racist narrative about our accomplishments. I think everybody knows now that we're the greatest seafaring voyaging community in history. 
But if we rely on people like Thor Heyerdahl to make up the story based on the data that was available to him, which did not reflect um, and empower our communities, in fact, it, it degraded our accomplishments. Um, and he wrote this book, Contiki, and that was considered like the status quo at the time in the 1940s. And this is him. He created a raft and he tried to drift because he thought that our, our ancestors drifted helplessly from South America into the Pacific. And that's just not what happened. And that's why when this guy tried to do it, and this is kind of the birth of what's called experimental archaeology, he crashed and it didn't work. This inspired a golden generation of exploration within the Native Hawaiian community. Many of you may know this and the birth of Hokulea. This is one of my favorite photos I've ever seen. I, was, I wasn't there, but it looks like a really good party. And it looks like Hokulea is arriving in Tahiti. And this is the application of many thousands of years of indigenous knowledge and setting the stage for the birth of the Hawaiian Renaissance. And I think moments like this result in this rebirth in our language, focus on all of these new forms of data that we've been using and been thinking about and allowed a lot of people like myself and many others um, to pursue the, the, the careers that we have and pursue different types of scientific questions. And this moment is really important for our people, but it also in a lot of ways is the birth of uh, the renaissance of our people. So it feels really good to get to assess this and create higher resolution looks at this using genomic data. So we talked about some of the archeological approaches, but it feels really good to look at and refine these paths and timing of the people of Polynesia inferred from our gen genomic networks. And here you can see um, that we're using many of the, the names, the place names that our communities, for example, example, call many of these places, right? Raivave, Mangareva, um, not the Gambies, right? Uh, Rapa Nui, Rarotonga, et cetera. It's really beautiful to, to hear them, but to see them in some of the most influential scientific journals in the world and to get to refine those estimates and get to understand how extraordinary that is and get to look at the cross section of archeological and linguistic and um, genomic information to again, refine our, our diaspora. And it's also disappointing when the media still continues to th say things like, no one could have predicted DNA offers surprises on how Polynesia was settled, even though we said that wasn't the case. Now, what's interesting is that if that happens, and you have some agency like I did, we also get to combat that narrative and get to write about this in Scientific American. And it's beautiful to put a picture of one of our, uh, here's the Kiakahi from Keokaha, the one that I have had the pleasure of being on and sailing on and seeing all the time in Hilo cruising. And it's also beautiful to see our language in Scientific American, you can see it says or the future is in the past, or we're taking notes from our ancestors and understanding how our diaspora is not just connected to how we got to places like Hawaii, but how that has had an impact on our health. And so when uh, people from our communities are involved in interpreting that data, it changes the narrative. And that in itself is the operalization of indigenous data sovereignty. That's why it's really, really disappointing to know that the vast majority of genomes that have been sequenced are not from our communities. And that results in a lot of different forms of bias. And you can see that over time. Now, these are the next slide is the more updated numbers. So check this out. We're looking at 95% of genome-wide uh, association studies being in individuals of European ancestry. This is from uh, a very, very recent uh, slide here, and the data is updated. 
And you can see that we've slid backwards from 2005 to 2009. In 2018, we were at 88%, and we've now slid backwards. So I want people to think about and reflect on what that means in terms of offer, offering precision medicine to historically marginalized communities all over the world. But to make matters a little more dangerous, the many different ways we introduce bias in these studies, I have another statistic for you, and it's that 72% of genetic discoveries have taken places in three countries. Look at Africa, the continent with the most genetic diversity on planet Earth. And what I'm seeing is that their genetic information is being outsourced to places like the USA, Iceland, and England, because they don't have the infrastructure built in to maintain that, to, in, to, to see that it's, it's processed locally. That's a huge problem. And it's something that we can actually change by building capacity locally. And that's another really huge reason why data sovereignty is extremely important. Because when you begin to think about what the resource that makes some of the largest companies in the world, the largest companies in the world, you start to see that it's data itself surpassing oil as the number one commodity on planet earth in 2018. That is the resource that powers Google, Facebook, Amazon, et cetera. And when you start to think about data like a resource, like water, oil, diamonds, timber, rare earth minerals, that should click over and you should start to realize that we cannot, as indigenous people, be giving away our genetic information because it is way too valuable. Not only is it our mo'oku alhau and the high resolution view of where we come from and every single one of our ancestors, but it's also medically actionable. It's also very valuable in terms of creating generational wealth and intellectual property and many other things. So we need to build structures around that. Okay, well, I just want to yeah. give you a time check that we're at 728. Okay, okay, I'll wrap it up. All right, and we know 23 and me is making money off that. Um, so what is the future of data sovereignty for indigenous peoples? Well, we need to think about vertical integration, just like Ford did, just like amazon.com does now. That's why we built NBDC, which is a genome sequencing center and research institute on reservation land in Cheyenne River. And here are some of our founders here. Um, and that's why we're training the next generation of data scientists through Indigidata. Um, if you haven't applied or you haven't encouraged your students to apply, please do. It's a really awesome experience. Um, and we're thinking about enhancing ethical research with communities. This is a, a, a group of us at SING, the Summer Institute of Genom uh, Genomics. And we're thinking about equitable benefit sharing from the the commodification of our genetic information and making sure that it ends up in the hands of our people. Uh, companies like Variant Bio are very much interested in this idea. That's the foundation of their mission. That's why it's disruptive to the 23andMe's of the world. But there is no substitute for grassroots research and democratizing technology. The utilization of mobile tools to de-black box and create transparency around technology. Here's uh, a study that we're working on to think about gout, gout prevalence in our community, um, and reimagining the way we build laboratories and where we build them to serve our people, being a little bit more creative about that. We don't have to centralize everything in major universities. We can serve our people at a smaller scale. That's exactly what BioNTech is doing by, by recognizing that they can manufacture many different things to make RNA vaccines on site in sub-Saharan Africa in shipping containers. They can ship all the things they need to do that on site. And it is a departure, again, from the status quo and something we should be thinking deeply about in Hawaii, which is one of the most remote places in the world. And thinking about challenging the way we fund people. And we started a, a, a little... Fast Grants program where we're giving away $5,000 grants focused on indigenous futurism and climate resilience. And here are some of the people we're, we're funding. 
Many of these people are people we love and know and work with, including um, Cliff Capono, Lydia, um, and many others that are working on incredible, uh, and Vahia, Mililani, um, awesome, awesome projects that are focused on the future of data and data sovereignty. And thanks to all these people. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. So, I, you know, um, I want to unspotlight me. I'm going to try and unspotlight me. And mm -hmm. I just want to spotlight the three of you guys. And I have two questions because ideally we would want more audience. If you have some, please put them in the chat and we can follow up with the speakers. But I wanted to start a question with Desi and then I want to throw it to Uncle Emmett and Kiolu. My question to Desi is, you know, in all of this discussion about data is sovereignty, you know, data is our relations, what is the role or what should be the role of universities and academia in supporting indigenous peoples? I'm wondering if Desi, if you can kind of take that one. So, I mean, like, it's funny because we're all paid by universities, right? Like university feeds my kid. But at the same time, like, um, I believe very strongly that universities need to get out of the way. Um, uh, very strongly. You know, I, I think like what um, Keolu had mentioned, right, that there are HBCUs, right, historically Black colleges and universities that serve the needs of the you know, of Black communities. Similarly, right, we have tribal colleges. We have over 30 tribal colleges and universities that are on tribal homelands, right, that have direct ties to sovereign nations. Um, and so I think we have to really think about what is the relationship, right, of of Western institutions of education, right? As opposed to what is the responsibilities and relations that our institutions have, our being indigenous, right? Um, and so I think if we're talking about Western institutions, I think they need to get out of the way, right? I really think that 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 Western institutions of higher education serve as gatekeepers and they can they continue to be um to really, you know, uh, create a lot of obstacles for um, us in doing the work that we that we know needs to get done. So we can be faculty, right? I mean, I'm the only Indigenous woman ever hired in the social sciences, you know, here at UCLA. Um, it's absolutely out of control. Like that should never be the case. Um, and you know, in trying to do the work that I I I'm here to do the work of the people, right? For the people when it comes to data. But guess what? The institution itself really, really doesn't want me to do that, right? The institution wants me to be a very good sociologist and to do the research that they deem is important, right? Which is the research that's going to get published in uh, American Journal of Sociology, which is not the work that I do. So I think what I see is that they need to get out of the way because we are already doing this work, right? We already have the relationship with community. We are already training the students who are going to go back into their communities to do this type of decolonizing work. Um, and so, if I were to go off the record and uh, and say what I believe needs to happen is they need to get out of the way. That's the perfect answer. And, you know, that, you know, if they don't get out of the way, then, you know, I wanted to return to one of the questions I had. wasn't able to ask um, Uncle Emmett. Maybe this, you know, Desi's answer is, is the solution. You know, for Uncle, what is what are the areas of health practice around data are the ones that concern you the most? And then, you know, shifting to Keolu then, how do we get to this ind indigenous genomics future? So maybe Uncle Emmett and then Kyolu can answer. Well, well, we started off with the University of Hawaii School of Public Health and, and uh, did all right, but then it was more difficult. It was more difficult because they weren't looking at programs that would improve upon what we found. So we had to do it on our own. Um, <clears throat> the only thing that I need to work through is with the uh, John A. Burns School of Medicine and, and their research, so it's really tough because they've got so many, I'm not qualified as a researcher, right? I don't have a PhD, I don't have a background in that. So um, so I find, I find working with universities is okay, but we really need an advocate and uh, within the system, like uh, they can help us push it up and push it through. And I don't see that except for um, your program, um, Dr. Aligato, as, as one of the few things that would kind of make us get back into the university. I remember I was challenged way back 20 years ago by the Kanaka Oli Foundation to establish a sperm bank, you know, because there was 
depopulization. We were wanting to revise that pure Hawaiian bank so that there would be more of that coming down to us, you know. And it was not that, and especially from the university point of view. So, you know, that's still something is a challenge that I need to kind of see through. Um, I think the biggest problem we have as Native Hawaiians is that we don't have the federal recognition and that we don't qualify for all the monies that would go through wherever because we have to share all our health funds with Native American Alaskan Natives. Most of our federal funds come from you folks. And there's going to be a time where that's going to be cut because there's not enough. And I could, I saw that when negotiating or arguing for the programs 25 years ago. And so I'm surprised we lasted this long. And, you know, until we get that sovereignty that we talk about, um, until we can get organized, was it reparations or restitution or whether we have to settle the illegal overthrow, you know, uh, we just can't own things as, as, individuals. So we have to work out a different way to kind of own our own data. And, and it's going to be difficult. So in the meantime, we've got to come up with alternative programs so we don't lose everything and the momentum that's created. But um, hopefully good things will come out of this. Uh, we'll make sure they do. Or like all of us will. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, maybe Keolu, you can you can bring us home. With, with what you think the answer is in terms of indigenous genomics in Hawaii, how do we how do we move forward? Do you see a clear path? Um, I'm also seeing in the chat a question about, you know, on the subject of owning DNA, you know, um, DNA tracking systems, maybe not necessarily showing the true genetic makeup of individuals um, and, you know, please. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um... I think ultimately we need to build our own infrastructure and capacity and vertically integrate many of those pieces. And I think we are doing that. It takes time. It's literally building on the legacy of what people like Uncle Emmett have built. It's going to be on our backs as well. And it's going to take a lot of time and energy and effort and concentration. And we're well on our way. And I'll say that. Now, regarding the um, DNA tracking, I think what the person is alluding to is that when you return results from the 23andMe kind of experiments, they're not an accurate representation of your, your ethnicity, right? Your, your culture, your heritage. And in some ways, that's definitely true because they're only assessing a small percentage of your genome. So... You have to take that with a grain of salt when they're returning results to you. Um, it is, remember, it's a business. And that, that's what I'll say. I mean, I think the important thing to remember is your results from 23 and me cannot tell you who you are. Whatever you get back will not make you more Native Hawaiian, will not make you less Native. You know, um, it's really you're either you know you're aren't you are native because you are you know because yep. that was the way that you that is your that's your lineal descent that's who you're raised for um well can i add could i add it rather than paying the 150 just go to the library get a few books on olelo and your history for free that's how you can strengthen your identity i i think does he said it correct the ancestors know who you are period we don't need a test but we do need to, but we do need to be careful, and we do need to um, steward, you know, the information that is our right to benefit from. So I want to, I want to ask Uncle, Uncle Emmett, do you want to close out with anything as we close out tonight's discussion? Well, so, so it's, it's really exciting. It's really building the team that uh, you put together, uh, your group has put together, um, maybe. Um, we have a small group of us, uh, two are, are in the uh, audience and the other is Kayla and myself, who are coming up with, with um, documents envisioning um, an indigenous genomics clinical research program proposals. 
um, we kind of like thought maybe we'd have to hit the hospitals first. Um, but there's so much we got to figure out and I don't think they can deliver us owning the data as Native Hawaiians, that they will own it on behalf of the Hawaiians. So we got to like look at all that stuff. We're just looking at other alternatives and and hopefully, hopefully we'll be back um, in touch and we see that it is still possible. Um, you know, I'm not a fisherman, but as fishermen say, you don't say we're going fishing until you catch the fish because the spirits and or others will kind of scare the fish away. Um, but, you know, it's, it's exciting to have a, a small group and hopefully we can expand upon that group and take more ownership uh, for um, envisioning a program to establish a Native Hawaiian Indigenous Genomics um, Center someplace and wow. you know that. That is so exciting. And I did want to respond. Somebody asked, will the panelists be able to share their contact info? Um, if you email, if you meet, if you email us um, and you guys who registered have our email, please email us and we will pass on those questions to the panelists. And um, with that, I just want to thank the panelists again tonight for sharing um, their, their time and their energy and being in community with each other and with us. And I just kind of want to give one final plug um, that on May 12th, we will be talking about creative works and in specifically what makes creations and innovations Maoli and what protections exist and are needed. And I will be passing the baton on. You will not be seeing me as a facilitator. I'll just be tech, but we will be having Kamuela Inos from the Office of Indigenous Innovation here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Kuha Ozane um, from Sig Zane and um, the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation, Carrie Kehau Noi of UH Hilo and the Lava Lab, and Keola Raposo from um, Fitted Zone Hawaii. And we will be having a roundtable discussion. And these are all native makers and creators. And um, we hope that you will join us. For more information, please visit us on sciencesinthesacred.com. This and other um, seminars that we have are fully recorded so that you can access it at any time. And we know that we have a very large viewing audience of, of asynchronous viewers. So mahalo for joining us tonight and aloha.